The aim was true. She was dead. She knew she was going to die right now. That the boy had tried to kill her before, and now he was going to finish the job. She kept her eyes open and waited for the sting of the arrow through her flesh to her heart. Hoped it would be quick and not too painful. Hoped it wouldn't get her in the face. Did she deserve it? She was simply trying to make money, make a life. Was that a sin? The sin? Was this justice for the pain caused by splitting up this odd family? She thought briefly, but completely, of the things she would not do in life. Children, see Greece, see Hamilton. Uh, Greece, the country, Hamilton, the play. Not Greece, the play, and Hamilton, the person. She, that's not in the writing. She should have had more ice cream. Her equinox toned ass was about to be a useless accessory on a corpse, a thing of the past, worm food. <clears throat> she thought of her own father, hoped to see him again, if there was an afterlife. She keyed on the sound of the shaft as it flew nearer to her, ripping the air, and then curiously, impossibly it seemed, missed her, continued past, and made a sticking sound a few feet behind her left ear. It was only then that she heard the rattle. She turned, and there in the dirt, in front of the spooked horse, still rearing and stomping its hooves, stuck in the ground, wriggling, bleeding, and dying, was a big angry rattlesnake inches from her leg. The snake stopped writhing and died, pinned by the arrow through its open attacking mouth like a science room specimen, through its small brain to the earth. Maya turned from the snake back to look at the boy. Hiram was still on one knee, left arm extended in a fist clutching the bow, right fingers in a cocky free frame, elbow high by his ear where he had released the bowstring. He had a smile on his face and a full quiver, less one, so sure of his first shot that he hadn't even reloaded. So that's the end of the first part of the novel, the first section of three. And I'm here. <laughs> hey, David, that hey, was terrific. Yeah. That's, that, uh, and it's not the only bow and arrow scene in the novel. I don't want to give too much away, but there no. might be more. So cheers. And I'm, yeah, cheers. I'm so glad uh, uh, all these people get to join us for our once every three month cocktail. That we have. <laughs> I wish we could see them all, but uh, I know. Me too. I guess that's not possible. Yeah, we'd have to buy them drinks or <laughs> share our muddy Pittsburgh water with yeah. them. I guess, uh, I guess. I guess what I should have what I should have said is that <clears throat> when when Maya stumbled upon the compound, Hiram, having never seen a, a, another person, another adult outside of his family, uh, uh, was afraid or angry and 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 clips her with an arrow. So that's the reference she made. Yeah. That that bastard had, had shot her with an arrow before, and now he's going to finish her off. Yeah, that's a terrific scene, and I love this book. I uh, congratulations on it. Thank it's you. Launching today, I believe, is your publication mm -hmm. day. It is. Uh, there's probably absolutely no difference between the, the uh, premiere of a movie and the day a novel <laughs> comes out. It's probably exactly the same. I I, I think these days it's exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, probably is. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm the thing about, uh, I mean, that's a good question because the thing about, the hard thing about movie premieres is they come out and it's like everything, is, there's so much pressure on that first week, the, the first day, the first weekend, whatever. Yeah. And it's almost like its fate is sealed after those first three days. And it's, that's its place in history. It's it's going there unless it gets resuscitated in some way. Or, but that's so rare. Yeah, so rare. Yeah, uh, and a book has a little more uh, staying power in that way. There's there's a little more pace. A book can can wait. A yeah. book a book has more patience. Yeah. You no, know, a book doesn't have to come out of the gate like hellfire. You know, it can be discovered yeah. later. Yeah, when you think of the books that you loved. You probably came across them well into their lifetime. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly right. And, and, and they're just laying around right now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, one of my favorite things uh, when I get the physical book and it shows up um, since, so this is your fourth novel, uh, yeah. and I believe in the last six years, five years, <laughs> um, that feeling of, because uh, I know you've always valued writing so much. Um, yeah. I have a little ritual where I put the book on the shelf, you know, right after Hugh oh. Walpole or wherever it goes. <laughs> um, do you, what, what, do you, 
Do you remember that feeling of getting your first novel with the? Uh... Yeah, yeah, that, it, it was. It, it's weird to say, but it was it was one of the happiest feelings that I've had. That you know, because and again, because movies and television are so collaborative, it, you know, you, you can't really take uh, you know ownership. It's it's a dubious concept anyway. But yeah, you, I'm not going to hold like a DVD in my hand in that one. <laughs> yeah. But but the book is it's all there in that thing. There's nothing else. There's no projection of it. There's nothing. It's just that that's it. Yeah. And the, and there's something about both the finite nature of holding the whole thing right there. Like that's all you need. It's just right there. It just needs a, a pair of eyes on it. Mm -hmm. And then um, the weight of it, just the physical weight of it. I mean, this all starts to sound very fetishistic in a way and very weird, but. I'll have to say this, that my, my mother, who's 91 and, you know, has, is not, is not reading anymore. She, ha, she treats those first books well, that, that I gave her the exact same way as I do. She just holds them in her hand and kind of, yeah. she's like a, a baker or a, or a butcher, you know, she's, yeah. kind of, feels good, feels good, <laughs> good yeah. way, you know, yeah. and, and then there's something about just having the experience of having a notion and then pursuing it and however long it took you to do it and however many hoops you had to jump through to get it out there and then somehow because you persevered for good or for ill i'm not saying oh my god this is amazing this is an amazing yeah. thing but you know what it took for you to push that thing out of you and into the yeah. world and then you're holding it it's it it, it is it's a nice feeling I think that that's exactly that sense of of uh, of completion to have a physical representation of it to be able to put it on a shelf. It's yeah. uh, I totally agree. It doesn't uh, work as well with with this. It's like right? <laughs> yeah. book, the book is in here. Uh, yeah, I sliding think, sliding I think the there. Kindle on a yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when my my father in law was a huge reader, and I couldn't wait to give him my first book. And, um, uh, closed it and said, "Could have used a map." So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which was it was right. It really could have used a map. Um, I, I, I love that scene you read because it there's there's this quality of the book that I I think of you as this as a philosophical novelist like Camus or Iris Murdoch or Vonnegut. I mean, I think you really are putting these, engaging these questions as almost thought experiments that come to life, you know? And so, um, uh, and, and if someone would have told me that the most like quintessential American protagonist I'd read this year would be a former Hollywood stuntman turned a uh, Mormon polygamist, I would have said, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> but can you talk Not a little bit about- not, yeah, not yeah. again. No, but it's but it is um, the logic of it within the novel. I mean, I really see how how you can sort of write this, you know, writ large American story over this character. Can you talk about how you came to the idea of uh, Bronson Powers as? Uh, yeah. Well, I I I am trying to engage on that level. I mean, I really once once I got to to the idea, I really felt like okay, this is. This is going to be my American. Not, this is about America to me. This is my, this is my conception of of where where I think we are right now, and um, <clears throat> the the really the inspiration, aside from all the the little the plot details and all that stuff, but the inspiration comes from Harold Bloom, who I know you've you've talked about being envious that I got to study with him. Uh, which is it's just it's just adorable that you say that. By the way. <laughs> Only half envious. I, I think I would have been terrified too. Um, but he, I never studied uh, Joseph Smith with him. I never studied religion with him. I think I only took one course with him, and I believe it was Romantic poetry, nineteenth-century uh, poetry. So I, I don't think we we would have touched upon this at all. But I I would always buy his books, and he was he was very prolific, and. Uh, I forget which book it was, American Religion, maybe something like that. I can't remember, but he he talked about Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, as a, as an American genius, and I was like, what? You know, because I, like most people, had this conception of Mormonism as super straight, super you know, Book of Mormon type mm -hmm. type, laughable almost, you know, and um, I. 
when when I real when I, when I heard him speak about what he called the genius of Joseph Smith was, he called it an American genius, in the sense, first of all, that that Mormonism is the only religion that grew up in America. It's it is the American religion, um, and it's very positivistic and self help almost. I mean, there, there's a very famous almost catechism that goes where man is where God once was and where God is man may be. So there's this sense in which humans are becoming gods and also just in the, and what could be more American than that? You know, there's no like European ennui in this religion. It's, it's super gung-ho American. And, and also to, um, to, to think that just in the name of, of the, the Church of Latter-day Saints. So, so the idea is that the miracles haven't stopped happening. This is the place to be. Jesus came here. The Israelites came here. Uh, America is the place to be, and Americans are the chosen people. They are the Latter-day Saints. And I was like, well, this is, this is, this is not just Mormons. This is about some kind of a not the ego of the country, but the, the, accept, yeah. the, the sense of exceptionalism. That, that, that self, like self-determination that. and that, I mean, it, it's the only self-made religion, like a right. self-made man. Right. So, I, so ever since I read that, I was kind of fascinated just by that idea in a, in a religion that was, because so many religions obviously are based on traditions that are thousands of years old. So they're they're backwards, not backwards looking, but they're they're based on texts, and and people are constantly looking back on these texts that are ancient and beautiful and wise. But but this was the first time I'd heard like, oh, we're doing it now. We're yeah. you you write your Bible. I got my I wrote my Bible. You write your Bible, and I was just like, okay. And I I guess I just filed it away somewhere, and then, yeah. you know. I, that I came, you know, there were other there were other kind of fringe beliefs that were interesting to me, uh, polygamy being one, and and then blood atonement being the other, which are not practiced by the Mormon Church now, but they're they're really good for novel writing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, you know, then I then I it just kind of cohered after a period of probably twenty years, you know, yeah. of, of not thinking about it actively, but just like it was back there. It, it causes you to create a protagonist who is complex, um, not on the surface likable. I mean, he's, um, you know, talk about a patriarchal character. Yeah. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, which I think is, is uh, always the mark of, of an ambitious and great novelist to, you know, to be working in that, in a character that, that challenges even the, the novelist in that way. Do you, but I, but I started thinking about your background as an actor too. That's that's a um, that's a meteor role to play. It, you yeah. know that that complexity. Do you think that? I mean, it's hard to think of yourself not as yourself. But do you think you come to um, characters because of your acting background uh, differently than maybe you might have before? I think so. I probably do. Um, I, I certainly execute scenes in a way differently. I, I think I write them as if I'm watching them. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of the in terms of the the characters, I think what I'll take out of your question that that I may regret <laughs> is uh, it, I was thinking when you were asking that, you know, as as an actor, I, I deal with people who think they know who I am or, or what I am or what I like or what I do. And um, I'm fascinated by the way in which people get each other wrong. And uh, when I create a protagonist who is, as you say, on the surface, if not unlikable, then definitely difficult. Uh, I'm interested in writing his story from the inside so that we can still not like him, but we're going to have to feel for him. If yeah. I do my job, we're going to have to feel for him. And I think you know, I probably had, you know, a natural in, interest in doing that uh, as a, as a, a person born to, to write or interested in writing. But I think my experience of being a public kind of a figure and dealing with people's perceptions of me yeah. and just going, uh, 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 yeah. um, it makes it m even more interesting uh, yeah. to me to, to write a character 
from the inside out like that. Yeah, I, I want to read this really short section just because I uh, it sort of leads into that. Um, this is describing Bronson. He had no use for Freud. He had Marx. He was suddenly in love with the world as an organism, really, America as a being, not the self as a thing, enthralled with the macrocosm without, not the, ma not the microcosm within. He devoured American history textbooks, cottoning initially to Richard Hofstadter before being further radicalized by Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States as a continuation and companion to the Mormon Bible, The Pearl of Great Price. He visited Delilah's legacy, Delilah's, his grandmother's left in this amazing piece of land and surreptitiously built a shed the exact size of Thoreau's cabin. I started thinking about the place you wrote this book, which was um, <laughs> uh, a very small cabin yourself. And yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it all, th there is that sort of merging of this project that uh, Bronson is on with the project of trying to describe America through him. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there is a, an Emersonian Thoreau uh, quality. There is a transcendental quality to this, uh, to the world that you're exploring. Yeah. Um, uh, and you were writing in that small space. Does that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, but, but you're right. Um, but but I, I think, well, for me, a small space, just, just like a practical sense, a small space works when I'm writing. Just I, I'm not one of those guys that can write in Starbucks. Uh, <laughs> I, I feel too exposed. Not that anybody's reading over my shoulder, but just yeah. some shit could go down. I like a little, I, I like some safety because I'm kind of in another place. And, um, you know, small space is also easy to take care of and there's, and, 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 and it's hard to mess up so badly. And I, sometimes I think of myself when I'm writing as like a cat in, in a shoebox, you know, the way they get so cozy and they, they curl Ridged up. In. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, I feel that way, but, you know, you point out, uh, Emerson and, and I mentioned Thoreau there and, you know, one of the, the great essays that I remember reading in college was self-reliance, you know, and, and. And sometimes I, I also think that sometimes my, I look at this, my style of writing and I think I, I've unconsciously almost adapted this kind of aphoristic Emersonian uh, way where you're kind of stabbing at ideas or, or, or um, descriptions. And, I, and I, I kind of like will spiral through a few trying to get to the idea. It's almost like I'm, I'm, I'm firing bows, uh, firing arrows at this idea but in my mind, I can't get it. So I'm going to have to like circle the bullseye with a few arrows. Yeah. And, and to me that it's kind of the way Emerson, I'm not, I'm not comparing myself to Emerson, but I think that he was, must have been an influence on me because I loved the way his short declarative sentences would just kind of, they wouldn't build an argument. They were all the same argument. Yeah. But they were just different sentences going after the argument. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting if you go back and read Emerson now, because it's not, he may be a philosopher, but he's not like a, a linear argumentative philosopher. He's like, the first sentence is exactly what he wants to say. And then he, he rephrases it until the yeah. end. Yeah, Do you, I, but I think that feels truer than hitting the bullseye um, with some pithy aphorism that for is me. undoubtedly not true anyway, <laughs> but it, because it lacks complexity. Well, for me, yeah. I mean, I, that, would, that would be my excuse anyway. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, that's my that's my feeling. That's the way I think. Yeah. Uh, I, I you know I, although I do try to come up with pithy af aphorisms sometimes and yeah. fail. no they're they're there too. Um, <laughs> do you uh, was this book different than the other three for you in the writing of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean all of them. I I, I know a little bit about what I, what I'm doing and where I'm going, and there's some left up to chance. But this one was, I don't know, it's not, forget spoiler alerts, whatever, but the, 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 the week, it's really stupid for a writer to point out the weakest part of his book, isn't it? <laughs> the, 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 I just can't help myself. The weak part for me was the wager, you know, like how do I get Bronson off this land? There's no way, there's no way this guy is gonna let his kids go to school in Rancho Cucamonga. And I always thought, uh, I'll just finesse it or something. I'll just, I'll just write. Uh, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was, I was a little depressed about it. And I already started writing the book because I, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out from the starting line. So I just trusted, hoped 
that as I started to write, maybe maybe the characters would start to come to life and, and they would show me the way. And sure enough, that's what happened when, when Mary starts to get concerned about Bronson's relationship with, with Pearl. Okay. And that all of a sudden, when the deal is offered, Bronson doesn't have to say, fuck no. He still says, fuck no, but Mary says, no, but we have to do this. And then it becomes a, a betrayal between husband and wife and the children. And then it just became so much more rich and complicated. And I never got there on my own. And I thought about it a long time. I thought about how do I solve this hokey problem? You know? Isn't that interesting? Because we're thinking in these mechanical terms and it's only when you bring human jealousy and desire <laughs> and that the mechanical becomes unnecessary. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, that's so that's so smart because it's like, those are the only stories that we tell. I mean, we tell the yeah. same stories. We tell stories yeah. of love and jealousy and revenge and murder. And, you know, that's, that's those are the human stories and, and the mechanics of it. Yeah. yeah, I guess, I guess that's what we have to play with and make believable, but it always those big, yeah. those big emotions are going to come to the rescue if you can earn them, you know, yeah. if, if you yeah. can. Yeah. And that goes back to character probably. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, that's another thing. It's like when, and I think we've talked, we might've talked about this when we talked about the cold millions, but th there's a time, there's a time in the writing of, of the book, this book, especially you asked what was different. Um, there was a time in the writing of the book where the characters just start uh, talking to me. Um, and, and, and then they start to dictate not only what they're saying, but they'll, they'll start to fuck with the plot too, which yeah. is, <laughs> and then sometimes you gotta go, okay, buddy, you, you, you might get your own novel at some point, but this isn't it. So yeah. just shut up. Yeah. The, um, uh, every once in a while in my most ambitious moments, I'll imagine the, the, uh, writerly quote of mine that lives on and they start to fuck with the plot seems like a, <laughs> oh, that's that's your those that's your aphorism i would love yeah. to have that be uh, I'd love to have that live on uh, i also <laughs> other than I, I think of you as a philosophical novelist but also as a comic novelist in the big grand sense the the folly of human sort of comedy but also the satire and there is hollywood satire in here you have um you know with bronson being a former uh um, bodyguard and uh, I forget what he's what he's built his house from um, but the the detritus of old TV shows <laughs> yeah well they plunder you know uh, uh, most people probably don't know this but um, when you finish a movie uh, all the stuff that the characters wore all the clothes that the actors wore aside from the ones that these cheapskate actors will steal <laughs> on the last day of work. And I'm not even kidding. And I'm guilty myself. Where, where did that shirt come from? <laughs> came from set. But that's only because, <laughs> no, it's only because I'm in Pittsburgh. I ran out of clothes. I'm stuck here. And I asked set to lend me this. I may Lucky give it guess. Lucky you know, guess. I, I may not give it back. I don't know. I kind of like it. But um, so, and, but it's also the furniture and all that stuff. Yeah. If it didn't come from a rental house. And so that's all warehouse because it gets reused. I mean, studios are smart. They're going to warehouse that stuff and use it again. So when Bronson is building his house out in the desert, he asks all his friends that he worked with, you know, for years and years in Hollywood, not only to come help build, but, you know, to plunder the warehouses for, for chairs and couches and stuff for them to live with. And they actually have a, a I, I think they have a couch from uh, Beverly Hills 90210 or something. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Brenda's couch or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The um, uh, and and then Maya, of course, is is connected to the finance side of Hollywood. Yeah. Um, wh when you're when you're, I, I I'm a big believer that you can only satirize what you love. Um, <laughs> really effectively there's there's your writer quote that is my writer quote it's not as good as yours but that's I all right like it. but um were, were you what what was it like uh i mean it, it seems like something you've uh you know both uh it can be an easy target having written some hollywood satire with beautiful ruins yeah. myself it can be almost too easy a target and yeah. yet that knowing satire that there is another thing that's big and american about about the entertainment industry yeah well I certainly love it, you know, so I can write, I'm thinking about it now that you asked, the camaraderie and the brotherhood of, 
well, stuntmen in this case, but just of mo people, movie people, is real. And there's a love there. Um, it's almost like a, a circus, you know, circus people. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't say that as satirically at all, but um, I also have a great love for the um, schlocky uh, horror movies that I grew up with. Uh, I grew up watching Chiller Theater in New York. I don't know if it was all over the country, but it was a swamp. The the logo or the, the preamble was a, a swamp with a, a six-fingered hand that would come out of the swamp and it would say Chiller. <laughs> and it scared the shit out of me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little afraid just having done that. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I used to love movies like Abbott and Costello Meet the Werewolf. Mm -hmm. And, 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 uh, I've, I've realized that that's because I really, I really wanted to watch a scary movie, but I was too afraid. And yeah. Abbott and Costello were in it. I knew that there, it was going to be a little lighter. Abbott and Costello meet Dracula. I would, yeah. I wanted Abbott and Costello to meet every one of my fears, basically. Yeah. If they could. Yeah. Abbott and Costello meet the fear of drowning. That right. Would be meet meet Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so. That's baked into me from my childhood is Saturday afternoon, you know, crappy B movie horror flicks. So, I I I decided that uh, the boss in, in of, of the evil corporation in the book was going to buy a library of of old horror titles because I looked around Hollywood the last 10, 15 years, and I I my jaw drops on the floor that. Captain Marvel and Captain America and you know all these things that I grew up thinking were not so much crappy but just you know just for kids yeah. Dis have disposable certainly right have take you know are the are just like the biggest tent pole movies yeah. in the world so uh, now everybody is looking for uh, a cool idea, you know, Wonder Woman, another one, like a, like a really schlocky 70s TV show. So uh, you shine it up and now you've got a 10 pole movie. So um, this guy, he's smart. He buys the Hammer Film Library. And I didn't know about Hammer Films until, because I still have this bad habit on Saturday nights of watching a program called Sven Gulli, which plays all these B movies from my childhood. Wow. Plays all the, all those, does Black it? and yeah. white movies wow. from the 50s and 60s. Yeah. And so Sven Gulli's a character. He's like the host, like Vampira was back in the day. And he gives you a little, you know, little history on it. And he started talking about Hammer Films one day. And I didn't know what that was. So I looked up Hammer Films and they had all these amazing titles. So what I've got is this guy, he buys Hammer Films for a song. And now he, he's making Maya. Uh, the, the woman, the, the protagonist woman in, in, in his company, identify a reboot uh, that is going to be like the, the, the uh, you know, the Wonder Woman. He's going to yeah. get a Wonder Woman out of this. Yeah. And he's, I can't remember the titles, but they're, they're like the, the vampire love. I think, Gorg, I think Gorgon is one of them. Gorgon. Which, uh, as I told you, I grew up next to a drive-in theater and, I, and I'm like, I remember Gorgon. You yeah. saw Gorgon? Yeah, totally. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's, is is it kind of a Medusa? It's a yeah. It's I think it might even I think it is a stop action monster of some kind. Um, but yeah. I mean, it, we we live next to a drive-in theater, and our we built a tree fort, and the screen was a mile away, so it was because it, uh, <laughs> it was we were in the very back, and it's we couldn't get scared of that. Yeah, we couldn't hear, so one night we snuck <laughs> over the fence and c clipped a speaker. And my buddy knew how to wire speakers. We were 12 and we wired it and I covered it with dirt and we took it, the speaker all the way back to our tree fort and put it up to watch Gorgon or Billy Jack or something. I don't know. And um, we hung the speaker and got made our popcorn and went up to watch the movie. And the theater manager is just pulling our wire because um, <laughs> it just was so obvious. We'd shorted out like the entire <laughs> side of the theater by cutting that speaker wire. That is, um, where that was the Spokane? Yeah, yeah, the East Trent Drive-in. But great. no, but I, but it, and statute, the great, I think the statute of limitations protect you on that one. Yeah, no, we were. Okay. I, I already did my put my. But, but I come, I come to those movies, not only with a fondness from my childhood. Yeah. You know, and I can't say that I watch them all the way through anymore. I just kind of get a nice warm feeling for a few yeah. minutes. 
Sure. But what I what is said in the book and what is true and what Maya kind of learns at first she's just pissed off that her boss is making her watch all this crap. And then she realizes that it's honest work, you know, that these and, and this is what I know as an actor, that it's just as hard to make a crappy movie as it is to make a great movie. Yeah. yeah. And that's the bitter truth of it all. And people who are out there, you, you know, whose work that you don't like or you want to make fun of, they're working hard too. Yeah. And there's, and, and I really, like if you talk about love, I have love for hardworking people. I have love for hard work. And the fact that Maya comes to that kind of realization at some point, I think she's talking about Christopher Lee, who was like uh, the, Peter the, Cushing, I believe. Oh, Peter Cushing, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jess, you're right. You correct me on my own work. Uh, Peter Cushing. But it could, but who was the Christopher Lee Cushing. of Peter Cushing's? <laughs> yeah. And uh, she just realizes that that's a noble life, you know, yeah. to have worked that hard to identify vampire, lesbians, and gorgons, and all these things. Um, and sometimes me having been on the X-Files or whatever, I, I probably think that way about myself. Like sometimes I would have been, oh, a little embarrassed of, of something, but then I'd go, yeah, it's hard work. It was hard work. And, 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 and I showed up and I, and I did it and uh, you know, it's like that, that, that kind of love comes through for Hollywood as well. Totally. Because we talk about how pampered and everything Hollywood people are, but, yeah. um, you know, when you're doing the thing, you're, 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 you know, you're working 12, 14 hours a day and it's, it's, uh, there's integrity to it, I think, anyway. Totally. I, I think that that story you just told is almost like a little parable of, of how satire with heart lands and has meaning because it's, it is funny and kind of ridiculous when he buys the Hammer films, um, and and it's but it like all great satire, it feels like it's so true. Like they should be going through those old films looking for temples. Well, well, the 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 movie that she does identify, I I don't know why it hasn't been made yet. It's Doc, <laughs> yeah. Doctor Jekyll and Sister Hyde. I mean. Yeah. Why, why can't I watch that right now? Why isn't it? Yeah. Why is that not a, a limited series somewhere? <laughs> yeah. uh, but, and, and so you, you move through that, that movement of, of this is so real, then to that moment, it really is kind of moving when, when you think about Peter Cushing and you're right, making those, what we think of as schlock movies was just as hard, but in some ways without the reward of the respect. Yes, that, right. Then it's then it you were you're in, in a way doing it more for love. Than, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly yeah. right. And that's 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 where you know Maya's realization and my actual personal beliefs coincide. Yeah. You know, I I I, I love people that punch the clock. Yeah. 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 And that and that just totally comes through. So that that was one of my very favorite parts. There's also great satire about just the way we live as Americans and um, that the the characters the the kids who have to go to um i, I wanted you to talk a little bit about place too about um the setting of the novel and your kind of deep love for it but but you know it, in all of a sudden they're exposed to this america that they've missed and and you know um, from Fortnite to rick and morty um yeah. the way it sort of swamps them um you know it's again a really it's such an interesting proposition to create as a novel well the the uh the two well there's three locations in the book there's joshua tree there's rancho cucamonga and then there's santa monica which is where praetorian capital is but joshua tree is where where bronson is is raising his family completely off the grid and and uh, and they have not you are to believe that Hiram has not seen another human aside from yeah. this before. so yeah. I, it's probably not possible but in, you know, it's a book, so it's a novel. <laughs> it, it, it got, it, and, and when I was deciding on a, on a location, cause I, you know, I had the basics of the story. I just didn't have the land that they were going to fight over. I, I called or emailed my researcher and I was like, well, find me, find me a bunch of places in the country where there's uh, uh, a lot of Mormons, pockets of Mormons, and then possibly valuable land around it. 
because I, I didn't necessarily think that I could spend six months in Utah or, yeah. or yeah, I, I figured, I figured it was going to have to be Salt Lake. You know, I yeah. just figured it would. And then the, uh, the research came back and there were pockets like all over and there were interesting uh, like new mineral fights like tungsten, I think has become a, a valuable metal because it's using car batteries. So, you know, like uh, the economy will, will uh, shift the, the wealth around in terms of mineral rights. I, I was like, oh, this could be interesting. Like yeah. tungsten yeah. instead of gold, instead of yeah. oil. We're talking, um, but then I, I came upon uh, the fact that Mormons had had founded San Bernardino. They had founded the, the, the city. They had laid down the first roads. So that's when I went, oh, it's my Hollywood story, and I can stay in the caboose. I don't have to. <laughs> I don't have to go anywhere. And I can I can write about this world that I really do know that we've just been talking about. Yeah. Um, and that's when he became a stuntman. Before that, I didn't know what he did. Yeah. Um, I thought he was just an heir. You know, he just came into this land. I didn't know he was a converted Mormon until that happened. I thought he was just had always been a Mormon. So all all these kinds of things started driving both the story and the character. But so you have Joshua Tree, which is where his inheritance is. And then when the wager happens, the three kids are taken out to Rancho Cucamonga, which is a fairly affluent uh, suburb uh, outside of San Bernardino. So you have these three children who have great book learning. I mean, they, they it's not like they have been not been educated out there. They've had a great kind of Montessori kind of a field school from the three adults, but um, they know nothing of culture. They know nothing of the past 100 years, really. They don't know technology. They don't know any of that. So now all of a sudden they've got this computer in their hand. They've got a phone and shit toasters are going to blow their minds. Forget about <laughs> phones. So what I, what I was interested in that, yes, it was like of, of me kind of meditating on, on culture as it is today from a perspective of like no culture before or just book culture. And that was interesting, but also I wanted to set up this relationship for Pearl, who is the eldest daughter who goes to school. Uh, and she kind of starts to have a boyfriend, uh, Josue, when they start doing West Side Story at school. And um, so I was just fascinated in my mind to set up this relationship between uh, a girl who was more mature emotionally and even sexually with a with a boy who is way more mature culturally yeah. and socially so so she knows nothing of that and he knows nothing of, of that and i was like that's cool i, yeah. I, I want to write that i want to see that yeah yeah writing yourself into those situations yeah. um we have a bunch of questions but i i want to steer everyone if they haven't already read it to the that terrific essay in the atlantic that um you wrote about why you write oh, thank um, you. Uh, which I just, uh, I, I've seen that question a lot and uh, th I thought this was one of the most um, profound answers. So um, can I read just a little bit from that? Sure. A couple of, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, David starts writing about how his daughter asked for a, a tattoo um, uh, of, uh, of a phrase that he repeats, which and the moving of that. Um, uh, and, then, and then getting to this, to this question, uh, I write for my daughter and my son because I have this belief fantasy that when I am gone, if my kids could pulp my novels, make a kind of mulch of me, which they probably want to do, but uh, <laughs> much as I imagine researchers do to spin out the DNA of pulverized ancient dinosaur fossils, they could get my DNA from the pulpy mulch. That my kids, if they ran the book DNA in the lab, could see me there clearly, the footprint, the fingerprint, dad, David the mysterious spiraled math of my heart and soul that hid part of itself from the light and, ca and casually spoken words. And maybe this will free them of something. These books are my way of talking once I'm dead of speaking to the future. You also talk beautifully about your, the debt you owe to your parents um, in that essay. And so I really hope everyone reads that, but um, that, what, a, what a marvelous thing to get to write uh, to explain your fourth novel coming out. Well, I don't know if you meant to do this, Jess, but while you were reading that, it was very hard for me not to, 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 to jump in because you asked, 
your first question was, what's it like when you hold that book? And yeah. then I say that right there. And that's what I must have meant is like, when I'm holding that book, I'm, it's like, that's my 23 and me, you know, right? Yeah. There. It's, it's like, that's my DNA. And, you know, maybe I want to mulch it, you know, and, and do that, whatever that fantasy is, but, but that I'm in there and, and I'm holding it and I got it out and now it's in there. Yeah, no, that's terrific. Um, all right, well, we're going to go to some questions now because they've been piling up. Um, let's see, after the book ended, was there a certain character you fell in love with that surprised you? Maybe their story moved you more than it thought it would, you thought it would? That's from Charmion. Yeah, I, uh, the, the, the villain of the piece, uh, Robert Malouf, mm -hmm. who's, uh, who's like a, you know, he's a venture capitalist, basically real estate capitalist. And uh, the, the final chapter after the shit has hit the fan, um, Maya goes back to her boss, this guy, Bob Maloof, and he basically fires her and says, you know, don't ever say anything about any of this or you're, you're a dead woman, you know, and he's got the power and the, and the, and the, you know, he'll, he'll do it. He's, he's not, he's not bluffing. And it used to end with uh, Maya saying nothing to him and just like nodding and leaving. And then about six months after I was done with the, the book, I was just reading over that chapter and I was, I just started writing like Maloof's like final monologue. Yeah. And I had so much fun writing it. And it was just like, yeah, this is who I am. I am this scumbag and I win and I am noble too, you know? Yeah. It's much like what we were talking about with, with uh, Cushing and, and, you know, making schlocky B movies. He, he, he's, he gets the chance to speak of the nobility of his parasitism. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, I, and I have love for that too, I guess. I, I, I guess it took me a while to fall in love with him. Yeah. And, and I did last. And then when I started writing that stuff, I was like, this is the most fun. This guy's the most fun to write, you know, yeah. for me, his dialogue. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, did Bronson surprise you at all, his character? Or did you feel like he was pretty well? I mean, he's if his backstory is he he's such a searching character. Yeah, uh, he surprised me. I, I'd always kind of imagined him like a cowboy, and that he's a man of few words, and he probably is. But yeah. he surprised me. Um, you know, it's I can't help myself. He he got funnier than I thought. Yeah. He I just I can't I can't help just trying to make shit funny. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, funny. I, I like the idea that this man of few words would also be yeah. funny. My, my um, one of my daughters really wants to read the book and is a fan of yours. And said, "How do you know him?" So I think I'm going to tell her that I was your stunt man. So <laughs> she'll just think Bronson is uh, is patterned after me somehow. Um, I buy it. <laughs> buy it. Uh, uh, in your in your storytelling process, do you have storyboards, or do you have another method for working things out, um, as well as your songwriting too? Do you have a specific process for your ideas? Yeah, no, I mean, I don't store, I have storyboarded when um, I've written for uh, uh, screen, I, either either uh, movie or television, because I find that, you know, you need more economy uh, there. You can't, you can't, uh, you know, th there's a three act structure that kind of works, even though this book is also a three act structure, but um, so I, I, I can like have a structure before I do a teleplay or, or a screenplay and, and that helps. But with, with a novel where, where you can kind of meander around if yeah. need be, um, I have pads of notes and stuff like that. And, and I, you know, I'll have an idea while I'm writing and I'll, I'll write that down and put it somewhere else. And, and then I'll, look at all those notes at some other time and then I'll feather them back in. But there's no there, there's no kind of set way that I go about doing it. However, when I do write screenplays, I do use the note cards and I do I do find that it it, it is very helpful to, to not get lost in terms because uh, you know those movies and television are plot. They are plot. Yeah. And yeah. Um, plot does have a kind of pleasing three act nature to itself so 
Um, I, I, I'm just imagining you going in and pitching something. I'm going to shoot a bunch of arrows and never hit the target. Gonna, <laughs> it's going to be me. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, it's going to be a thought experiment, which in a horse. Uh, I, I philosophically. In a horse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Philosophical cowboy. Yeah. I, I, I always outline at the very end just to see what I've done. But do you really? I, I sort of do. At the end, I like to piece it together and see Does symmetrically. That... Does, I mean, when I'm when I'm writing, I don't. I like to meander all around similarly. But do you ever then go back and changes from that outline? I totally do. That's the oh. time when I think like, oh, I could beef this up or I could shrink this down. Or, but I but I tend not to do it until I'm, you know, until a month before I turn it in. Um, just well, well, what I did with this one was I did uh, when I was done. I all I did was I looked at the page count of the uh, of the sections. Mm -hmm. And I thought of it like a movie because I, I had thought that this was like a movie, even though there's no way you could do it in two hours. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, like like a, a, a felicitously weighted movie script, you know, the first act should be about 30 pages. The second act should be about 45 pages. And the third act should be another 25, 30 pages. So it's yeah. you know, bigger in the middle. Yeah. And, and lo and behold, this guy came in yeah. kind of like that. So I was like, okay, that's, that's probably a good sign, I thought. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, uh, that was from Pamela Dana. Dana wants to know if, you, if your writing process has changed since your first novel, if, um, if this one was different in that way. Um, probably not. Uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't think so, no. I, I'm a little impatient, I, I, I probably, well, I don't know that I'm impatient. Like I said before, uh, I feel like there's only so much thinking I can do without using my hands, without writing. Uh, I could sit here and try to plot. I could sit here and try to figure out character. And I, and I could be writing notes and stuff like that forever. But unless I start to put it in the line in a linear way of, a, of a set that wheel in motion, I, I'm not going to do the right kind of thinking that's going to be right for executing the actual book. I don't think I, my brain doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Pamela asks, when I read the character's name, I thought of Bronson Alcott. Was that an intentional since he was a friend of Emerson and Thoreau? Oh, God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, oh, yeah. I, I've never heard of him. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, Bronson came from Charles Bronson. And, oh, nice. Yeah. And, and then came Bronson, which was- I've a, never heard of Charles Bronson. <laughs> <laughs> well, Charles Bronson was like- uh, No, I have, I have. Yeah, I know, I know you have, but, but, but like the, the uh, Bronson, he was not quite an A, you know, he wasn't considered a great actor, but he, was, a, he yeah. was kind of a great, I guess, maybe, is he B? I don't know. But he was, to me, he was a great figure in, in cinema. He's a tough guy, he's great looking, a man of few words. Yeah. And it just, uh, he's also street, you know, yeah. in Hollywood. And it was just like very, all those things were cool for me. And then, you know, Powers, eh, I could have, yeah. maybe I could have done better than that. That's a yeah. little on the nose, but, but uh, uh, Bronson, I like. Yeah, well, and it's that another working actor, you know, another. Right, right. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'll tell uh, you the, reason why, the reason why I might, I might be a little unhappy with Powers is because as a writer, when I wanted to write the possessive of Powers, I really hated the way it sounded. Powers is, yeah, right. Yeah. So if I could go yeah. back, I might, I don't ever want to hear Powers is again. Yeah, although it is, well, you had to do the audiobook. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Powers is, <laughs> Powers is, yeah. Um, Katie doesn't apparently believe I was your stuntman and wants to know how we, be, <laughs> how we became friends beyond uh, the written word. We became friends because I had a project with, uh, uh, with the, for Taya years and years ago yeah. that, that you yeah. and Mark, you and your partner Mark Stylin were gonna were gonna write. Yeah. And then um, and then we just became fast friends, uh, both with you and Mark. And uh, then Jess and I reconnected when I was doing a reshoot on the Joneses. That's we did right. yeah. we did two days in Spokane, and Jess uh, allowed me to play in his. Uh, very competitive basketball game. I uh, didn't tell anyone who was coming to my game, and it took a few minutes for them. And someone's like, "I think that's David Duchovny." I'm like, "Nah, it's not." That's. Uh, I, think, I think. I think it was like, "I think that's David Duchovny who can't go left." 
<laughs> I think that was fun. Yeah. Nobody, nobody in that game goes. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Oh, I, I wanted to, so it, and, and there's a chance you might play Bronson in this, uh, in a version of this. Well, if, if we get to make it, uh, yeah. I will play Bronson, but yeah. yeah. Um, How does, the, uh, it's so interesting the, you know, writing something, adapting and having other people adapt it. I, I wrote a screenplay for one of my books one time and kept getting notes and changing everything. And I kind of set up in the middle of the night one time, but I'm the asshole who's ruining my book, you know. Uh, <laughs> Well, yeah. do you think about that, you know, having this character rise up, creating him and then possibly p portraying, does that change the way you think about the process? Yeah, but in, in a way that I like, because um, the, uh, the execution of this book to me is of a piece, like the book exists, I'm not going, I'm done rewriting it. I know you like to rewrite books that have already been written, but <laughs> I'm 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 done with it. I'm I'm happy enough. You know, it, it it I'm very happy actually with it. And now, if it's going to have a life as a as a series, already um, the idea is for it to be a series and not just the book. So the characters would live on past the action of 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 the book. So there's stuff that hasn't been written. There's li their lives haven't been written. So there's that. And then there's you know calling in people that I love and respect uh, to lend their talents to envisioning what this is because a, a series is different from a book. It's very different from a book. So if, if I were to try and start to re-envision it, I might be able to do it because I know both worlds, but it would be uh, painful. And I don't know that I'd be the best person to do it. I really don't. I, I would love to bring bring people in who do something a little differently for me and yeah. bring and bring something else to what is already there because there's a lot that's already there so i'd love yeah. to see that and and playing that character specifically um what what do you see challenge wise uh, does, uh does... i'm not looking forward to growing the beard again you know it's, it's pretty <laughs> much that uh, uh maybe he's got a beard maybe he doesn't uh i've never really played a cowboy you know i'm yeah. from new york city i, I ain't a cowboy and that excites me, you know, to, to to finally play a cowboy in a way. I mean, he's a he's a stuntman cowboy. He's not an actual cowboy. But, but there is a quality of the western of this, of the kind of neo western. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there's discussion in the book uh, in Bronson's mind too. Is that I think I say uh, stuntman is where cowboys went to die. You know, all the skills of the cowboy is what the stuntmen do, especially in the beginning of Hollywood. They do yeah. they do all the horse riding, all the roping, and all that stuff. So. They are kind of like the cowboy of the 21st century still, you know, and they have that kind of macho and risk taking and and life of uh, movement and, you know, and horses, too, of course. Yeah. And um, are you on to another novel? Or are you do you have another idea for a book? No, I just wrote that short story that I shared with you. And yeah, which is uh, terrific. Yeah. I was happy to have gotten something out because it's been a while. Um, yeah. In some ways, you know, it's interesting. Uh, and maybe you're so humble, you'll never admit to this, but uh, you know, I, I, when I say I'm proud of this, I don't want to come off the wrong way, but I really feel like I pulled something off. Mm -hmm. And to, and the other books, they were good. I think they were good. I, 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 you know, I did what I wanted to do, but I feel like this is of a different order. And now when I think about doing another one, I'm like, ah, I can't do it again. Yeah. I can't do it again. Yeah. That one hurt. Yeah. You know, and uh, I got to get over that. Basically, I know you. You go right back into it, so you're you're. Smart. I do, and I'm nowhere near as humble as you think I am. <laughs> I, I am so fond of myself that it, uh, I can barely begin to scratch the surface. But uh, but I but I do think um, the, the the beauty of it is that you never write the same book twice. You right. Know? Um, and that they, and that's also the horror of it because you don't ever know how to do it because it's a brand right. new thing. It's a totally yeah. new thing. But that, that process you describe of, of, you know, wallowing around and it, running around and it, finding your way in it, right. um, you know, it, it's a real investment, but it's well, yeah, because, because when you look backward, back on it, you see how lucky and how it, it yeah. didn't have to work out that way. You could have made the wrong choices and then you and you go well i probably won't make the right choices again 
you know, yeah. I'll probably fuck it up. Yeah. So, you know, when I think about all the things that had to fall into place while I was writing for me to get the story in a decent way, um, first and foremost, just the I, San Bernardino thing coming my way. That didn't have to yeah. come my way. Yeah. Um, stuff yeah. like that. So yeah. I don't know. I don't see it happening again. I'm just like, that doesn't <laughs> want to happen again. I don't know. I, I, I mentioned that sometimes between novels, I write a short story and what's David do goes and writes like a 15,000 word, beautiful short story that he sells an hour later. So I think it'll probably happen again. Well, tell me, just go tell me to write a novel then I'll go do it. Yeah. So. Go, go write a novel. Amazing. Yeah. Way. Okay. Got it. Re write a novel called the water of Pittsburgh. That's what <laughs> um, All right. Last question. Um, is uh, about the title and what meaning it has, um, which seems like a good place to end to remind people the title of this book so they go buy 10 copies for their relatives. <laughs> the uh, uh, Truly Like Lightning is a quote, uh, it's from a Joseph Smith quote, where he uh, is, is, um, he is he's describing the uh, angel Moroni uh, in, a, in a visitation to him that his countenance was such and such, uh, and he was truly like lightning. And I just thought it was a beautiful phrase. And um, I just always held on to it. Um, Do, and, does the title resonate for you when you're writing? I mean, the it, it comes up several times in the book, these rising moments of action that feel almost like that. It's a biblical, you know, it feels biblical. It, um, it uh, Sometimes I think the title can kind of can plant itself in yeah. well, well probably i mean i think the first chapter ends with with lightning and no rain yeah in the desert and i yeah. i doubt i would have i would have been writing about lightning if i if i hadn't known that that was the name of the book i was writing that i and then that i somehow wanted to uh get bronson and lightning on the same page in some way as as this guy was almost like as unpredictable and as dangerous and as beautiful and, and as necessary as something like lightning. Yeah, it's lovely. Well, I think that's it. Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks, David. Yes, thank you. That was a real pleasure as always. And yeah. uh, we'll talk soon, N not in front of people. That's it. Let's, I think we should always make people Please show up for a cocktail. Okay, yeah, let's do that. That's better. Yeah. That's better idea. Right. Well, you two come back to the Center for Fiction anytime. Every time you publish a book, we'd love to have you. It's wonderful uh, to have you. you again. And I hope the book does really well. Thank you all for coming. I know you're all getting copies and uh, enjoy the novel. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.